We think of ourselves as somehow separate. We think of ourselves as, as superior and having domination over other species. And ecology teaches us that actually if we continue to do that, then the system itself will respond to us. We are living as part of that. We can make choices. We can evolve to live better with other species. But if we don't do that, nature will move against us and we will be diminished as a species. I think that is the primary lesson of ecology. We're not at the top of the hierarchy. We are dependent on all these other species. It's so clear in the case of bees and the decline in insects and pollinators. But, you know, not, not the bees that create honey, but the bees that do the pollinating. Without that, we wouldn't be able to eat. We are part of this system, and the, the sooner we understand that, the sooner we will have a much more comfortable existence with each other and with other species. And I think the most important lesson of ecology is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Ecology teaches you that life on Earth is about a system. We can't possibly understand how that system works. We basically have to have, to have awe and reverence for that system and accept our part within it. That is the attitude we should take if we have ecological wisdom. So here's just one little example of that, the soil food web. It's just unbelievable. I mean, I sit on the Agriculture Committee in the European Parliament, and we, as Greens, we, we just love soil. You know, to a lot of people, it's dirt, isn't it? But we absolutely love soil. It's a really good example of a, a complex ecological system. There are all these little creatures in, in the soil all the time. You never notice they're there, and they're all kind of doing their little bits of, of the processes. You know, so you've got these bacteria, for example, on the roots of plants, and they are helping, some of them, help to fix nitrogen out of the air and make that available to the plants so the plants can grow better. All the time, in, in good, healthy, good quality, healthy soil, that process is going on. And you've got all sorts of other creatures here that are recycling and reusing um, nutrients and making nutrients available to the plants. And it's, it's a really complex system working on all these levels, which, again, unfortunately, we fail to understand, and all we can do instead is say, oh, well, you know, if you put a lot of nitrogen over there, then that'll be fantastic. You'll get a lot more yield, and we'll have a green revolution. But actually, all we've done is killed our soils. And then you have a heavy rain, and the soil is actually lost. There's more coming. <laughs> so, you know, I sit there in the parliament. Literally, there's two views. There's people that, that love, value, and respect nature, and want, want farmers to work in collaboration with nature. And then there's the sort of agribusiness, unfortunately, there are about three quarters of us, but there's the sort of pro-agribusiness people that think the answer is just more chemicals. And they do not appreciate how they are killing the soil. And we need to have these healthy soils in order, actually, in the long run, to be able to produce enough food to eat. So here's again coming back to something Craig was saying about feedbacks. Feedbacks is a thing we learn from ecology, from the science of ecology, how feedbacks work. And there are really powerful, impressive feedbacks when we think about trying to understand how climate change is working. If I get these wrong, Craig will help me. But one of the really important ones is this idea of the albedo effect and ice at the poles. So obviously it's problematic if the ice melts because we'll have rising sea levels. But also that ice at the pole is white, so it's reflecting more sunlight, so it's preventing more heat from being absorbed by the planet. And as that ice melts, you get into a feedback loop where you have more heat coming in, more melting, less reflection, more heat, and so on. So... You, you don't just have the initial problem, you, you create a feedback problem and the initial problem is made worse. Similarly with the melting of the permafrost, the permafrost is holding a lot of methane gas. As temperatures rise and the, the permafrost starts to melt, that methane gas is released. It's a very powerful uh, climate gas, so it causes an increase in temperature, causing more melting, and so on. So this idea of feedback, because I remember when I first heard this, maybe 20, maybe 30 years ago, it was so powerful to me, and yet so many people have, have simply not grasped that that's what's going on with climate change. This is why it's a very tricky problem to solve. And when people first started talking about these, it was theory. But now we're very quickly seeing that this is actually happening in reality, and it makes it much more difficult to deal with climate change. Anyway, I'm not going to be gloomy, because there are ways of dealing with climate change. But I think what this teaches you is how incredibly complex the system of life on Earth really is, and how our arrogance, we've meddled with these systems without understanding them at all, and we do have to accept with humility that we need to work with nature in solving these problems. So what did we learn from ecology? 
I think one of the most powerful things we learn is from using ecology as a metaphor. So there's whole schools of um, philosophy now really being taught in universities around systems thinking, around thinking about the complex system of, of life as a web, but then moving that into understanding other processes and other social processes. We understand that systems involve interdependence between the different actors. It's not just a relationship from A to B and back from B to A. It's a complex system of relationships between many different actors or players or species. What's important, again, is, is not the hierarchical relationships, but the horizontal relationships between all these species, between all these different actors in the environment. And this makes what is fundamentally a complex system. I've already talked about feedback loops. Now, as an economist, I was interested in this because I think this is exactly how the economy works. If you learn economics the traditional way, like Satish was talking about, what they teach at the LSE, um, essentially, it's incredibly simplified. You, have very, you, you, you only think about what you can turn into simple mass, and you reduce a person to a sort of very simple machine that is just seeking to maximise pleasure or maximise profit. But actually, an economy is a complex system of human beings interacting with each other. So what some economists are now trying to do, ecological economists, is to put this learning from ecology into economics and think how we could run our economy in a way that was not only sympathetic to nature, but also was assuming that the economy was a complex system. So a lot of, who knows about permaculture in here? <laughs> it is wonderful, yeah. Um, so I would say permaculture is a way of thinking about relating with the soil and growing food from the soil that takes into account the wisdom of ecology. But also you can use the understandings of permaculture to change the way you think about economics and the economy. And so there's various design principles, they're called, in permaculture, and I've tried to apply them to thinking about the economy. So one of them, for example, is use edges and value the marginal. That's something nature does. You know, we tend to focus on the thing where we'll get the, the biggest yield fastest, but nature actually uses all the interesting little niches and spaces. So what would it look like if you did that in terms of the economy? Well, guerrilla gardening as an example. Who's done guerrilla gardening? Mm -hmm. Come on, get out there and do that. I, I saw a really brilliant example of this when there was... Well, obviously, there's always really bad potholes. We're living in austerity Britain. But uh, <laughs> when people were going out into potholes and putting a bit of soil in and putting flowers in there, it was, it's absolutely brilliant. You know, it's kind of inspiring. But it's a way of making sure that all those edges and spaces are used well. And that's, I think, a, a good example of the kind of thing we could be doing. Craig already mentioned the circular economy. I think that absolutely adheres to the permaculture prin principle of producing no waste. Use, va use and value diversity. Again, that's not something we do in the economy. We say we want a certain kind of person. We want an efficient and productive and highly trained individual. We're probably thinking about a man, let's face it. And, but the reality is, if you work in an organisation, you know that all sorts of people bring different kinds <coughs> of quirks and insights and as a, as a large team, all of those things are valuable and useful. And one of, the, uh, one of the permaculture principles is obtain a yield. And of course, in any system, that's also important. So um, as an economist, I'm going to stick that on my list. What's coming next? Oh, yeah, a little bit more about the circular economy. This was a nice display and demonstration we had in the parliament of people who were Basically, it's make, do, and mend. You know, they, they, ran a shop. they run a shop in Brussels, and you can take in anything that's broken, and they'll mend it for you. And that's something that used to be normal. You know, even, I can even remember rag and bone men. But you can remember them, can't you, Satish? They used to come around, and they literally, we had a rag and bone man, and it was a cart drawn by a horse. I kid you not. I'm only 54, but I can remember that. And, you know, they would take any scrap from your house and turn it into something useful and resell it. And that's... The kind of, you know, that was an economic reality. You could do that. You could make money from that. But now we live in this incredibly disposable, throwaway world where people are actually, um, where, you know, you actually have built-in obsolescence. And you have a, a printer, for example, where after it's printed a certain number of sheets of paper, just a little chip in there kills that printer. It has a little death chip inside it. And uh, if you're really smart and really geeky, you can go off and reprogram the chip. 
I, I can't do that myself, but there's ways of finding out how to do that. But what a crazy thing when you've got a printer that could still print so many more pages, that no, you, you just have a chip in there that's going to kill it, so they can sell you another printer. I mean, when I first heard about that, I thought that's a conspiracy theory, but I'm afraid it's a conspiracy fact. <laughs> um, anyway, so, you know, we, we can move towards an economy where things are repaired rather than being replaced. And two good examples of ways to achieve that are these directives from the European, uh, from the European Commission. Am I I'm bodging my microphone? Aren't I? Um, so those, I mean, I'm sorry, in European politics, everything has a kind of crazy acronym or abbreviation. <laughs> so that's the end of life vehicle directive and the waste electri electrical and electronic <laughs> equipment directive. There we are, the we one, which obviously wasn't invented by an English speaker. But anyway, <laughs> the point is about these. What they say is, in the case of either cars or electrical products, all the way through their life, they belong to the manufacturer. So when they have to be disposed of, that job is down to the manufacturer. So when your computer breaks now, you have to take it back to the person that sold it to you, and the person who manufactured it is responsible for paying for the disposal. So it kind of puts an end on the linear economy process before you, you get to the waste part. And so it, it blocks that system, and it encourages the producers to make goods that can be reused and that last for longer. It's a nice example of where a piece of policy can actually change behaviour, I think. Um, I just wanted to quickly say something about economic growth and how crazily out of control it is. We spent quite a long time fighting our way through the latest version of Excel to get this one for you yesterday. <laughs> Why is it every Thank time they redo Excel it gets harder to use, <laughs> less, uh, less functional? Anyway, this is, this is what's happening with economic growth. I just started from the time when we joined the European Union to sort of pluck that, num you know, that date out of the air. But anyway, um, actually, an interesting thing, though, is you can see the, the financial crisis and the real change in the trend, which is very unusual to see something like that. But anyway, the basic point is our economy is designed to grow. It's growing out of control. We measure GDP. It's just the size of the economy. <coughs> we don't try to measure whether that economy is making people happy, whether it's doing anything useful. We just focus on size. And this is the main design feature of a capitalist economy. And it's, it's kind of chewing up resources and eating up energy and throwing out stuff which we buy just in order to be able to do that. But we need to scrap this as a measure. I think the next slide is sort of illustrates why that's the case, does it? Yeah, because that's what growth is like. You know, this, is, this, is gr this kind of growth is malignant. It's destroying the planet. It's out of control growth. We need to focus much more on the quality of the economy and stop thinking about the quantity of stuff. But the reason we don't do that is because of this very interesting quote here. Growth is a substitute for equality of income. So long as there is growth, there is hope, and that makes large income differentials tolerable. In other words, if you, if you didn't have more next year than you had last year, you'd start to ask why somebody much wealthier than you had so much more than you. And this, the reality of this is shown in the fact that since the economy stopped growing, people are much more disgruntled about the inequality we see in our society. So part of the reason we keep the economy growing and keep trashing the planet to do that is so that people don't ask too many questions about why there's so much inequality. And as Wilkinson and Pickett, authors of The Spirit Level and founders of the Equality Trust, say... The relation holds both ways round. It's not simply that growth is a substitute for equality. It's that greater equality makes growth much less necessary. It's a precondition for a steady state economy. So we, we need to build an economy that is much more equitable. And then, well, we need to, uh, to stop the economy growing. And in order to do that, we have to make sure that, it's much, that what is produced is shared much more fairly. So I think somewhere along the line, somebody asked this question. Our economic crises sidelining green issues. I mean, it's, it's quite noticeable that people, when, when people have their basic needs met, or when they feel that they're living in quite a stable economy and they know they have a secure job and their livelihood is fine, then they have the space to think about environmental issues. That is the theory anyway. So do we see in reality that as we are in an economic crisis and incomes are falling, are people losing interest in environmental issues? I would say not. I mean, this is um, Jesse Clavers. He's the kind of pin-up of Greens at the moment. He's the leader of the Kern Links, which is the, the Dutch Green Party. And uh, 
He's a very inspiring young man, and he is really creating a lot of enthusiasm around green politics in the Netherlands. If you lived in another country, you'd find out about other people's politics. We just don't have space for that because of Brexit but, and other things. But, uh, and anyway, please, if you're interested in what green politics is doing on a European level, please do follow my newsletter and find out what we're doing because we have so many wins all the time and it would really cheer you up. This week we had a really big win on a tax report on, um, on a report on tax avoidance, stopping corporate tax avoidance. We're sort of well on the way to banning glyphosate. We also, the Greens basically wrote the new migration policy which was adopted in the Parliament and now we're going to try and get the Commission to follow it. I can't remember, there's a lot of big wins just this week so please follow, you'll be, you'll be cheered up I promise. And also, I think one of the things that Jesse Klavers argued during the recent general election in the Netherlands was that effectively the centre ground of politics is disappearing now. A lot of people are moving to the far right, the kind of radical right, even the fascist right, and that's because they're scared and they think the conventional politicians don't have answers. But Greens are also in a radical space, but a radical space that's about continuing with democratic politics but also uh, respecting nature. So I think we're beginning to see the breakdown and loss of faith in the old parties. But I, I certainly believe that green parties are offering a vision of the future which people can believe in. I've just brought a few statistics with me about some good results. There's the um, result from the Netherlands where Greens quadrupled their number of seats. So Greens ended up with 12% of the vote in the Netherlands and actually the traditional socialist party, like the Labour Party, got 6%. <coughs> so it was quite a shockingly bad result for them. Um, and in the recent elections in Germany, again, the Greens saw an increase in their vote, ending up with 9.4% of the seats. You may know that they're currently in discussions about going into government, which um, is going to be pretty tough on them because they have to go in with two right-wing parties. Anyway, that's, uh, that's a kind of watch-this-space sort of thing. Obviously, I need to say something about the election in this country, where I tried to be the second Green MP and unfortunately didn't succeed. But... Um, Although our vote was actually halved, and partly because we tried to encourage people to vote tactically to stop the Tories, so I feel we've slightly gained something there. Um, we did, it was still our second best result ever, and obviously you're not surprised to hear me say that I think our electoral system is totally outrageous, mm -hmm. and if we moved towards a fair voting system, we would have had a red-green government a long time ago, and we'd be well ahead of where we are now. Yeah. So, good, you can raise questions about that, or just agree with me. Um, I just wanted to show you this one because this is, a, this is a classic bit of economistic thinking. This is what's known as the Easterlin paradox. I always put it in quote marks like that because this is a graph that compares subjective well-being, so how, well you, how good you feel about your life, against GDP. And what you find is that after a certain level of income, that line flattens off. So what it tells you is after people have a certain amount of money, and extra money doesn't make them very much happier. Now, the bizarre thing is why is that called a paradox? Because, oh, because an economist called it a paradox, right? Because economists mean, assume that money makes you happy. And the more money you have, the happier you are. So according to an economist, that line would look like that. You know, the people with the most money will be the happiest, the people with the least money will be the least happy. We all know that that's not how human beings are. There's plenty of songs that tell us that. Can't buy me love, for example. <laughs> Um, so, you know, basically something's very wrong with our economic model when what we're trying to do is to produce more money and stuff and we're not thinking about whether or not that makes people happier. I feel I'm running out of time, but I haven't got very many more. So now I wanted to go on to kind of addressing that issue Craig was raising about the way we're not connected back to nature. I've been really inspired in my work recently by working together with indigenous people Here's an example of a group called Guardians of the Forest. He came to the Parliament yesterday. It's always my stuff, and I'm like, yeah, the, the Guardians are coming, the Indigenous people are coming, this is going to be a great day. They're tremendously inspiring. They're really fighting that battle for nature. They live so close to nature that they absolutely have to fight. Their, their life, their livelihood, their whole existence depends on defending their forest. And... Many of them are murdered every year. You know, we say we're activists and campaigners, but these are people who are right on the front line and are being killed. And their perspective is this perspective, the land does not belong to us, we belong to the land. I can actually remember who told me that, or who said that to me, which was an indigenous person from Central America about 25 years ago. And it, it totally blew me away. I was left quite confused for a couple of days. 
until it sort of sunk in. And it's a really important insight. We belong to the land. Land ownership is a meaningless concept. It's a bit like, does ecology matter? You know, it's only people like us that would ask, that would think you could buy land. To, to people like these people, it's simply just, it's not something that they can compute. And, and I think they're right. And that sense of reciprocity with nature and mutuality with nature and with each other is... It's just basically the secret to a, to a good life for us and to a good life where we live in harmony with nature, I think. I've got a... Oh, no, here, oh, well, I'll read you this quote, because I think, I think Kirkpatrick Sale actually sums it up really well. In societies whose very existence depended upon knowing the earth and how to hunt its animals and forage for its foods, the way of life for 99% of human history, respect for the natural world and an appreciation of the land itself as sacred and inviolable was surely inevitable. That sensibility was literally so vital that it was embedded in some central place in each culture's myths and traditions and was embodied in each culture's supreme spirits and deities. This is what we have to relearn if we're going to stop destroying our planet. Have we got um, Lolita next? This is... I'm going to get her name right now. Aura Lolita Chavez Ichkakich, she's called. She's absolutely fabulous. We've nominated her for the Sakharov Prize this year in the Parliament. And she's such an inspiration. She's an indigenous woman from Guatemala. She runs an organization called the Council of Quiche Peoples for the Defense of Life, Mother Nature, Land and Territory. Whoa, I think. <laughs> and um, she's a, so she's a community leader of her own people. And... She's actually had to leave to live in Spain because she's been receiving death threats and many people like her have been murdered just for defending their, their <coughs> land rights and their need to... Their, and their communities. Anyway, her, her insights are just extraordinary. She's actually living in... Um, not Barcelona, Bilbao at the moment. And she was telling me when she got there, you know, she couldn't cope with all the concrete and all the sort of high-rise. And uh, somebody said, well, don't worry, there's a mountain over there. And uh, so she took a lot of young people up the mountain, and I'm not sure they smoked something. It wasn't quite what they had at home, but it was something. And she was explaining how she basically shared with young people from the university there the kind of insights and the kind of connection she had with the land where she lived. And it's just extraordinary. So, you know, I don't know what you might have to take, but just go and do that. <laughs> Make that connection with nature. It's so vital. <laughs> I've got a little video of her, but I feel I'm running out of time. But do check her out online because she's totally inspirational. So just a couple of last points. Very important, I think, life is relational, not rational. We, we live in here, you know, but that's not what makes us happy. That's not what really makes us tick and come alive as human beings. We've ended up with these rationalist, capitalist models of economic life, which Weber said have led to the disenchantment of the world. I think we need to re-enchant the, the world. We need to see nature. We need to have that awe for nature. And we need to see nature as something magical. And we also need to value relationships with each other and with all the other species that we share the world with. And this is what I call, at the end of my book, The Bioregional Economy. Because in The Bioregional Economy, I'm trying to imagine what life would be like if we could live like these people from where we are now. It was quite a challenge, actually. Quite a fun one, but quite a challenge. And um, then I ended up saying, well, you know, it's like living the full circle of life. It's like accepting all the stages of life. It's not when you get to the end of your life, oh, you know, somebody's going to die. Oh, no, it's a medical failing. We should have kept them alive forever. <laughs> you know, it's just it's such a failure of understanding what human lives are all about. So I also like that phrase, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. We're not, we're not here to go shopping. You know, that, we've got to aspire to something higher than that. And that's unfortunately what the economy reduces us to. We've got to really get a sense of who we are, knowing our place in space and time. Falling in love with your native soil. I, I lived in Stroud when I wrote that, so it was really easy to do. But if you don't live in a beautiful place like Stroud, go and live in Dartington. That's a good place to fall in love with your native soil. But, you know, you need to have that connection. It's... You sit under a tree. It's not that hard to do, I promise you. And, uh, oh, yeah, lastly, I wanted to make this point about risk and insurance. We had a... I'm part of a community farm still in Stroud. And the farmer there, um, when I was on the committee, I hadn't quite, obviously, reached this point of, <coughs> point of enlightenment at this stage. But uh, he said... I said to him, you know, well, have we got proper insurance for the farm? You know, what happens if, we, if somebody steals our equipment or we have a bad year or something? He said... We have a form of insurance, and it's called prayer. And I thought that was, that was great. That was about his commitment, his trust in the future. You know, we're not going to solve this problem by 
buying our way out of it or creating a lot of insurance. We can't insure ourselves against the end of the world. We have to change the way we feel about nature. We have to reconnect back to nature and have that respect and awe. Have I got to the end? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you want to keep in touch, there are all the ways you can do it. I really recommend checking out Lolita because she's absolutely brilliant. And if you want to be cheered up about what green politics can achieve, please follow my work in the European Parliament, sign up to my newsletter, because lots of good things are happening all the time. We don't need to be depressed about it. Thank you very much.